Looking for a website or domain? Then check out today's sponsor, Squarespace. Hello everybody, hope you're all doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. Having watched the recent Starship launch and seen the work it did on redecorating the launch pad facilities, I was reminded of the moon landing skeptics claims about the lack of a crater under the lunar module and the lack of dust in the feet as both apparently being proof that it never landed on the moon, but instead was just placed on a moon set in a studio on Earth. They argue that a rocket engine would blast a huge crater in the floor and that all the dust that subsequently kicked up would just cover the lunar module, neither of which we see in the Apollo photos. So we'll tackle the dust and then we'll tackle the crater claims. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is one of the leading website creating and hosting services on the market. They have dozens of website templates to choose from that suit all needs, and the templates can then be extensively customized very easily to make your website look however you want. But Squarespace offers many more tools as well. You can set up a blog, you could add a scheduling system to allow appointment bookings, you could set up your own online store or even start a marketing email campaign for your subscribers. To start with a free trial today, head on over using the link in the description, squarespace.com forward slash Dave McKeegan, and to get 10% off your first purchase, then use the code Dave McKeegan at checkout. Now, back to the video. We can see in the onboard video of the Apollo 11 landing that there is dust being moved by the engine on descent. Buzz actually comments about them kicking up some dust about 20 seconds before they land. Pretty feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. And we can actually see the dust being moved about 20 seconds before that. So why isn't any of it caught in the scooped feet of the lunar module? Well, under three of the four legs of the lunar module, there are these long rods sticking down that are about five feet long. Now, when any of these touch the moon's surface, they sent a signal into the spacecraft and illuminated the contact light, which we can hear Buzz call out. Contact light. Now, the procedure was that as soon as the contact light was called, the commander would hit the engine stop button, and that would immediately stop the throttle on the engine. Steady. Nine. Shut down. At that point, the lunar module's feet are still five foot off the floor, and they free fall that last little bit. Which is fine because they're only in one sixth of Earth's gravity. But it means that the feet themselves didn't hit the ground until well after the engine had stopped kicking up dust. As for the claim that there should be all that kicked up dust settling back down over the lunar module, let's consider the environment. When we see dust being kicked up by things like dune buggies on Earth, you see the initial part that's being kicked up is a very dense, tight stream. But it then hits a wall of atmosphere surrounding it, which causes the dust particles to slow and move about, and it causes it to plume into a large cloud. Helicopters landing in deserts are an even better example. Helicopters' lift is created by rotors forcing air straight down. This downward air doesn't create a column of air that blasts all the way to the floor, it gets slowed down by the atmosphere underneath it. Which is why we don't feel huge gusts as helicopters fly high overhead. As the helicopter descends near to the ground though, we can see that the downdraft begins to disturb the dust on the floor. Now this air hitting the floor needs to go somewhere and it will take the path of least resistance. So it's not going to bounce straight back up off the floor because there's more air being forced down by the helicopter. So instead, it gets pushed out to the sides, like when we squash the middle of a softball. This air movement pushes the dust out sideways and away from the helicopter. However, it then sees the same effect that we see with the dune buggy, that this stream of high-speed dust is pushing into a wall of atmosphere that causes it to slow down, but there's more air behind it pushing into it, which inherently forces the dust upwards and then into a spiraling vortex. But on the moon, there's no atmosphere. The path of least resistance is still out to the sides because the thrust from the engine is pushing down from above. 
but there's no air resistance to slow that dust down and cause it to plume. It will only slow as gravity pulls the particles down to the surface where friction can slow it down. But with one sixth of Earth's gravity in effect, it will be quite some distance from the landing site before the dust hits the floor. So there was no dust hanging around in plumes for it to land on the lunar module because in a vacuum, the dust gets thrown completely clear of the craft. The only way that dust is getting into those feet is if the feet themselves dig into the ground when landing. Now Apollo 11 actually had the softest landing recorded of any of the missions. We can see in this comparison footage from the LRO data that Armstrong actually hovers around over the surface for quite a while before touching down. So the lunar module in that flight basically came to a very gentle rest up on the surface. Unlike Apollo 15, which had a slightly rougher landing. Eight feet minus one, contact. Apollo 15 was the first of the J-series missions which were intended for longer stays on the moon. They carried the rover, they carried more equipment and so was quite a bit heavier and subsequently Apollo 15 came down quite a bit harder, which we can see caused the feet to dig into the surface a lot more and that actually put a lot of dust in the feet. The lunar modules for these J-series missions actually had a, a longer engine nozzle as well to improve thrust but this reduced the ground clearance that they had, and you can see that 15 came down that hard, the engine nozzle actually hit the floor, and with enough force to cause it to buckle. It didn't matter because that engine was only being used for the descent, and by that point the descent was finished. But it shows that they came down hard at times. It wasn't just placed there, unless the crane driver on the set got a bit hasty. <laughs> but still no crater under Apollo 15. Right, let's get into that. This stuff is quite literally rocket science. I think when people imagine the lunar module coming down, they imagine this concentrated jet of thrust blasting away at a tiny spot in the surface, similar to what we saw with Starship. For context, the Starship's Raptor engines produce half a million pounds of thrust each, and there are 33 of them, meaning the Starship at launch was forcing 16.5 million pounds of thrust into the floor. By comparison, the lunar module's descent engine had a maximum thrust output of only 10,000 pounds, and that's 10,000 pounds at full throttle, but they didn't land at full throttle. When landing, they want as little amount of sideways movement as possible to avoid tipping and rolling the craft but they're coming down from an orbital speed of 3,600 miles an hour. The max thrust was really used to scrub away that horizontal speed in the deorbit burns far above the moon. By the time they came to touchdown, they were only at about 30% throttle, which was producing about 3,000 pounds of thrust. By comparison, a Black Hawk helicopter produces in the region of 15,000 pounds of downward thrust at liftoff, and those never leave a huge hole in the ground. Now I know Blackhawks don't have a jet engine and the rotors are covering a larger area, but we also have to consider the exhaust pressure. Now this is where it is actually rocket science, and I'm not a rocket scientist, but if you've ever watched rocket launches, you may have noticed that at liftoff, the exhaust from the engine stays very narrow, but then the higher the rocket gets, the more the exhaust plumes out. You'd think it would be the other way around, with the exhaust pluming out when the rocket's traveling slower, and then funneling in as the airflow around the rocket speeds up. Now this again brings us back to the effect of no atmosphere. At sea level, there is more ambient air around the engine which keeps the exhaust contained. When the exhaust pressure is equal to the surrounding air, you get a straight jet. When the exhaust pressure is higher than the ambient pressure, it plumes out. So as the rocket gets into the upper atmosphere, where there's less air to contain it, the exhaust spreads out further and further. Now the bigger the difference between the exhaust pressure to the ambient pressure causes a bigger and bigger drop in engine efficiency, 
So spacecraft actually use engines that are optimized for use in a vacuum, which aims to have a lower exhaust pressure, so there isn't as much of a difference between the engine exhaust pressure and the ambient pressure, which in a vacuum is nothing. Now, here is the complex part if you're interested. Engine thrust equals the mass flow rate of the engine multiplied by the exit velocity plus the sum of the exit pressure minus the free stream pressure multiplied by the nozzle area. In short, I think that pretty much means you can have the same amount of thrust being generated inside the engine, but if you let it expand further at the exit, you don't get as much pressure pushing out. For example, the Saturn V's F1 engines were geared for heavy lifting from Earth, so needed to produce its thrust whilst in atmosphere. Now, each of its five F1 engines produced over 1.5 million pounds of thrust with an exhaust diameter of 3.7 meters. The lunar module at landing was producing 500 times less thrust, and yet the exhaust diameter was 1.5 meters, which is less than two and a half times narrower. So 3,000 pounds of thrust might sound like a lot, but with a large nozzle of a vacuum engine, it wasn't actually pushing out much pressure to begin with but it would still have a higher exit pressure than the surrounding vacuum, so the exhaust wouldn't have been a narrow jet, it would instead be spreading out into a larger area underneath the spacecraft. So that, coupled with the relatively low thrust levels and the engine being cut off several feet above the ground, means there just wasn't much force being exerted on the floor to actually dig a crater. Although we can see in the Apollo 11 photos, clear signs of dust streaks radiating out from under the engine, as you would kind of expect to see from a spacecraft landing on the moon, not from a crane placing it there. But as always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. While you're down there, if you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. You'll also find the links for the offer from Squarespace down there, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.